he's very real. He's, you know, there's, he's not a plastic saint. He's not a, uh, he's not somebody that's up on a shelf somewhere. He's very real and, and very accessible. There was always discussion about when are we going to do something with St. Ignatius and really have a landmark statue. Why not see if we can find some young emergent artist who would be willing to do this? So let's have a competition. Jeremy and Joan happened to be the first pair we had in. And once we saw what they were submitting, we just canceled. That was it. We knew we wanted to go right with them. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that these two young artists were the people who we wanted to work with. The statue is intended to be a place of learning, a place of thought, critical thought and self-awareness and uh, reflection and prayer. It just seemed to work and it went from there. No one has has really captured the essence of the exam. This piece is obviously important because it represents something important about the school and so obviously the students and the reason why you would choose to come here for instance is uh, possibly to have more than just the education but also the the idea of self-reflection is a very important part of campus experience it seems like so um, that's I think that's part of why we hit upon that idea of examine in the first place. The examination of conscience is very close to the center, in a certain sense, of, of Ignatian spirituality. This notion that you know we reflect on our experience of life in the light of God's love and care and concern for us, and out of that reflection, we get a sense of the way in which God is moving our lives forward. For 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 me, one of the most powerful things about it is this opposition, this the dynamic opposition um, that is not it's not directly in line, it's sort of slightly, slightly off, it works on this diagonal. They, they, um, there is a sort of aggressiveness to his stance yeah. towards himself, and I really, I think that part works very well. The idea that this is work, it is, it's not, um, it's not passive, it's active. It's active uh, to, to really reflect on mm -hmm. one's, yep. right. one's role. I've never done anything like this piece before, so I've worked in a material similar to it, but I don't, I think that this is, this is definitely new for us. The idea of getting to the work of examination, sort of rolling up your sleeves. And, um, that theme represents really well what we try to do here at Fairfield. I think most of the people I know would probably start some sort of self-reflection based on the words. It was nice to hear from the students that the word was so powerful as well as the image. Didn't really think about them as separate things. Because um, they, they came together with the, with the idea for this. I find Ignatius a man of, of openness uh, and invitation, uh, a man of, of patience, but a man who, who takes everyone at, uh, where they are. I would understand why you took the cowl, because probably that's what the men wore when they'd be going all over the place to keep warm. But because it, it does right away raise the, the Franciscan that I can see, to change that. Almost everything that came up was something that we hadn't really, thought. well, for instance, we learned that a cowl is maybe not um, appropriate, that people were interested in, in what the meaning of uh, the hands behind the back, like I'm standing now is, um, whether that and demonstrates openness or not. It's all about the human being with the human being, and they can figure it out all on their own. It's very valuable for us to hear some kind of reaction to this because we haven't heard any reaction up until now other than we like it. But so this has been great. It's been very important. He, he, he would have to be wearing, you know, something black because a priest. His hands would be like this, like kind of like prayerful, but open. Larger than life, not too much larger, but probably like seven feet tall. Probably at a desk writing one of his very important, um, or one of his many important letters. He'd be looking down, he'd definitely be looking down because all those good statues look down. He'd be holding something like this. I think it would be a, a nice bronze finish, um, maybe look a little rustic. Looking down, and it, it would be straight down. He'd be probably kneeling with his arms folded, praying. Maybe a 
St. Ignatius statue with something symbolic would help, know, help people know what Ignatius stood for. The most important thing for me to do in my work, I feel like, is to do um, to do projects that really mean something to people. I think in the back of my mind, it was always going to be like uh, it was going to, going to be some kind of figurative art. I've always been interested in spirituality and religion. Um, one of the best classes I took, actually, in high school, was uh, history of religions, uh, which was just fascinating. I feel like it's something I've always been drawn to and always wanted to do since I was a kid. It just seems right, you know? In the studio, we've already started the armature and the building up of the life-size figure. It's a really important step because the armature really goes a long way in defining the gesture, and the gesture goes, is so crucial in telling the story and bringing the narrative into this. Imagine you're like looking into a mirror and you're like really like really leaning in there and you're like um, you know checking yourself out um, and so that was that was pretty much how the pose came about. As you can see it's made of water clay so the clay has to be kept wet um, otherwise it starts to crack and fall off the armature. Before we knew each other at all, had even a chance to become friends, we were sculpting together and working in a classroom setting and in the studio together. So it was a good way to get to know each other and we've been working together in the studio ever since. Figured we might as well get married if we were going to work together all the time. <laughs> These are very built Ignatius. If I put too much water on it, it'll start to crumble. <laughs> we actually didn't really know anything about Fairfield at all, but it seemed to me that the idea of looking into oneself made sense in a scholastic setting. So that's where the examine came in, and then we're like, okay, how do you represent somebody looking into themselves? Then Joan was like, it would be better if you just had two figures looking at each other. As soon as we cast the two and put them together, it becomes so clear to me that like, the, the kind of tension that's in this and sort of magnetism between them, it really made sense. Makes it a much more interesting piece, I think. Part of what we do is uh, you have to braze in these wires and uh, they'll get bent into whatever the shape of the fingers is. They're long right now so that there's room to bend them. That, the portrait, and, and his costume, so to speak, are stuff that we felt we could see in Italy. Uh, we got Autobiography of St. Ignatius. Um, I purchased some clothes that are free of stains, um, which I think is a good thing, you know. We're pretty much set. It's just packing, and we're out. It's basically a, a Jesuit site treasure hunt the whole yeah, trip. That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> it was like, here's your map, go find the Jesuits. We had our first breakthrough. Here's a Dizio. This is a Nazio. Pretty amazing. We saw like amazing 
artwork. Incredible sculpture. I'm gonna try and zoom in on these hands. Look at those folds. It was an incredible trip. I, we knew it would be good, but it was amazing. <laughs> The plaster model of St. Ignatius that was uh, commissioned in 79 because it belongs in St. Peter's, the original. Where he lived and where he wrote his letters and where he looked out the window and did his stargazing and where he died is all there in these rooms. I think that was the most like directly insightful part. I guess, I guess that's as close as it gets, right? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> we're, we're going a little bigger than that. <laughs>
worked those, you know, as you can when they're down from all angles. You know, you can turn it like this, have it in your hand and do all kinds of work to it that you can't do when it's up there. Then we dip them in wax, actually. It gives you a little better skin-like texture, I guess. I think what we learned about him is he was constantly questioning himself, you know? Constantly questioning, you know, whether it was just, you know, uh, vain glory to like try and do all the things that he was doing. And what you, what you read in his autobiography is that his confessor had a great deal to do with the fact that he even became what he did become because every time something important would come up, he'd be like, I don't want to do this. And his confessor would be like, no, you should go do this. All of that stuff, it, it talks about his attitude, you know? And so I think all of that kind of comes through. His capacity to receive new data and his capacity to reflect on that data and to see them, to see this data as, as somehow uh, coming from God allowed him to, uh, to make changes, of course, not in, a, uh, you know, in an irresponsible or flip way, but in a very courageous way. He seemed to have that genuine quality of leadership that you know, gets people excited about doing things and letting, letting them be free to do whatever you know, they think. He thinks we ought to be in China, you know, go to China. If he thinks you ought to open a school in Germany, we open a school in Germany. You know, it's a, it was that kind of uh, free spirit, I think, in terms of the apostolate that it, it must have captured the, the minds and hearts of people at that time, you know. To see him as he truly was uh, is to, to see that what he was able to give the church and what he was able to give me and give every Jesuit and everyone who does the exercises uh, is radically impressive. There is going to be this statue of St. Ignatius on campus that, you know, barring some catastrophe, is going to be sitting here 75 to 100 years from now at least. Um, and maybe it'll get moved at some point in the future, but it's not going anywhere. And then we, could, then we can add and see how you feel. Gee, I never thought about the way the sun's shining or the way... Exactly. There's a lot just, of things that have come into play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a long view towards things, so I mean, I. I I understand the importance of, get, of having this done on a certain time for a certain, um, a certain event that's going to take place here and, and the need for that to happen and, um, and the need to not necessarily move it. But I also know that the problems of the immediate future are kind of small in the lifetime of this sculpture, which will be a part of this campus for a long time. Then now might be a good time to look at the patinas sure. because I think they tie in directly. You know, this is our light and shade a response to that, not doing actual, you know, uh, blackened bronze. You have a grayish, whitish patina. Mm. And then uh, a, uh, a patina that allows the bronze to really show through. Boy, is it, is it subtle enough? Is it a dark enough shade? I don't know. Do you think this is too light, color-wise? Yeah. I was, was going to suggest opposite. going lighter. Mm -hmm. The light patina that was in question was something that I, I saw on a Mayol sculpture in Paris. Um, and it's this very silvery gray, and it's, it's actually an outdoor piece too, so I know it's going to work. And we just thought that that was going to be perfect for a light. Um, dark, to, to us, was just, I don't even think it was ever a question. It was like this, we knew a patina that symbolized that, that will allow us to get, not, not be black, but to pull out some highlights from the bronze and to have a lot of interest in the surface. So. It's a, it's a beautiful patina. It adds a lot of depth and a lot of warmth and a lot of action on the surface. We just want to make it the very best that we can make it and, um, and to have all parties be pretty happy about that so that we feel confident that 50 years down the line, people will still be happy with it. the mold making area. The first thing we do is make a mold of the object and the rubber takes all of the detail um, and then that's supported by a hard mother mold material which is fiberglass or plaster or something like that and from that mold we're able to make a wax that's an exact replica of whatever the object is. Everywhere you see bright sherbet orange rubber that's a St. Ignatius mold. <laughs> so from these molds like I said, we are able to make an exact wax replica of the sculpture. Here are hands in wax. It's feet. 
<laughs> Sometimes people come in with stuff that they've had made overseas for us to fix because the quality is so bad. Like, of course, that's not always the case, but it's often the case. And why would, why would you bother? You should make it here. I would say Brooklyn, more specifically. <laughs> The heads are already in the investment room, so you'll see those in the next stage. So, this is the investment room. I'll just get right to what we really want to see here. Iggy. <laughs> so when it's time to pour, this is just a piece of cardboard. This will be taken off, it'll be cut off the top, and the metal will pour through this funnel and circulate through these vents and gates into him. So he will be poured upside down. These have to be dipped over and over again to be strong enough to hold the amount of bronze that's going in, right? So it starts from something like this, it starts to build up to this, and you can see it just gets thicker and thicker as it gets closer and closer to being ready for pouring. We dip the pieces in here, we let them drip for a minute. The sand is next door, and you throw the sand onto the wet slurry so they combine and start to form this shell. When the, when the shells are ready, uh, we bring them in here and this is the burnout kiln. So what happens here is we put the shells upside down so that the funnel's facing down into this cage, roll this in underneath that kiln, bring down that container, and we heat up the shells really fast it makes them very hard and very strong, and it also cleans the inside out and melts the wax out. So then you have a perfect, uh, clean, hard shell ready to receive the molten bronze. So this is what the, what the bronze uh, ingots and parts that we're recycling are melted in. It's a carbide crucible. The crucible will be inside this kiln, and this is what heats the metal. When it's just the right temperature, they'll lift it out of there and they'll bring it over to here where it is now, set it on this stone, and then they'll come back and prepare to pour. For that to happen, they've taken the shells and they bring them to the sand pit, put them funnel side up, and bury them in the sand. And the sand helps to keep them still, and it also helps to keep the, the bronze hot, helps it flow through everything. So they've got the, the crucible, you have two people on either side, you have a third person steering the chain, and they pour the metal into the empty shells. What they're going to do next is just take hammers and chisels and break all that shell off. And you'll have your rough bronze, and from there it gets sandblasted and taken to the metal chasing department where it's turned into the beautiful bronze work that you're expecting to see. So, there you have it. Awesome. <laughs> you're still filming. Yeah. You're supposed to turn that off now. We're out here today uh, doing the final layout for the Ignatius piece. And today we laid out the surrounding stones that'll be cut into the existing plaza, uh, surrounding the eight inch high granite base. This one falls, this is not one of the five points of the reflection, so it can stand alone. Sure. After much discussion, there was a, a final decision to locate the, uh, the St. Ignatius piece in the center of the plaza outside the chapel. Let it be written, so let it be done. Centered between the entrance uh, to the chapel mm -hmm. and the bell tower to the north. It's right along the main access between those two elements. It'll reinforce that access. So as people come out of the chapel, the two pieces once again are flanking each other. You look through the pieces and uh, onto the bell tower in the distance. It can be seen from uh, the north uh, as people uh, walk from the, the campus center toward Bellarmine be a prime location that uh, be viewed by many uh, on a daily basis. Today we're here at Giordano Brothers uh, and they've been contracted to do the actual uh, sandblasting. Once the de decision was made to place it in the chapel plaza, we were looking for a stone 
that was going to respect the gray of the pavers that were there and not look like it was too out of place. Granite became a natural material for us to look at. But once we made the decision to go with granite, we looked at local suppliers and vendors, and then we started to look also for uh, engravers, etchers, sandblasters. I've been doing this for about 35 years. Uh, didn't like it when I started. I wouldn't do anything else now. Uh, it's just, I love it. Back at Connecticut Stone, the, uh, the holes will be, will be drilled in for the statue. And then when it's brought to campus and the statue is placed in, we'll route the statue and the rods into the, uh, into the stone. We're here at Connecticut Stone. These are the raw blocks that the sculpture base was cut out of. This is the jet mist granite as it comes in from the quarry. This type of granite that you're using for this project comes from uh, quarries out in Virginia. It gets hauled up here um, in blocks around 10 tons in size. And the next step we would have to do is take these to our big saws and slap them out to the sizes you need it for your sculpture base. Overall, you can see that the, the monument was made in three pieces due to the size of it. Um, generally, blocks don't come in from the quarry that size. This here is the template for the uh, sculptures. Basically, what this provides is a layout for where the holes need to be drilled to mount the sculpture base. I mean, the exam is what just reflection, right? Um, and an opportunity to kind of look back on, on your day, on your experiences, and, and think about how they all fit together. You come in here, you're very naive, but then you see all these things and all these transformations take place. And over these four years, you grow tremendously as a person. If you don't look back and say, wow, that's where I came from and here's where I am, you're never going to realize how much you grew and you're never going to grow even more. In terms of art, reflection is very important. It becomes more than just the art that's visible there before you that you're working with. It's um, about all of the ideas and how you got to that moment. This is, this is kind of like a foundational piece of what St. Ignatius was all about, of, of what the Jesuit tradition is all about. This is kind of where, where it stems. It's going to stand as a symbol of, of discovery. It's going to stand as a symbol for this idea of the magus, the more basically going out and, and trying to achieve these big, huge things that you don't think possible. We're at the foundry, at Excalibur Bronze Sculpture Foundry. Today is the day that we uh, deliver, I'm going to say it's close to a half ton of bronze sculpture. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. I'm just hoping it all goes well. They're wrapped in uh, thin foam sheeting first, and then uh, some fleece blanketing and a uh, furniture blanket, and then bubble wrap. Never have too many straps. pieces they were supposed to arrive in. <laughs> oh, that's 
that's exciting. great about them is they can stand on their own without any without any threaded rod, without any mounting, which is pretty cool. They're perfectly balanced. It's kind of awesome. It's, it's right on. It's right on. They lined it up perfectly. It's so powerful in its simplicity. And I don't think any of us imagine just how powerful it was going to be to move this. It's overwhelming. Overwhelming. Uh, I mean, it's all struck by it. Well, it's a little, a little hard to say goodbye. It's all right. We knew this was going to happen someday. Yeah, that's what, that's what the end result. <laughs> yeah, the goal always was to uh, release him. You're leaving your kid at college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's totally what it feels like. I'm going to have that empty nest syndrome. This face is so alive. I feel like he's just standing right here with us. Well, now that it's done, we should go have this baby. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wasn't expecting that. <laughs>